Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's program. On today's program, we're starting a brand new series entitled Permanent Impairment Home Runs and Strikeouts. And the purpose of this program is to share with you uh, several recent developments in the art and science and philosophy of providing for alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman. Now, if you've been doing qualified medical evaluations for any length of time, you're by now familiar with the Almarez Guzman concepts and the ability for QMEs to be able to provide for alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman. But it seems that uh, there's still some misunderstandings as to how to correctly and how to properly uh, provide for alternative impairment ratings such that those alternative impairment ratings will be accepted by the parties. You see, it's uh, one thing to provide for alternative impairment ratings. It's entirely another thing to be able to provide an alternative impairment rating, which many times has the effect of doubling, tripling, or even quadrupling the impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides. So it's one thing to be able to do that. It's entirely another thing to have that double, triple, quadruple permanent impairment rating accepted and upheld by the parties. So in order to have the uh, alternative impairment rating upheld by the parties, it has to be done exactly, exactly right. And in this program, I'm gonna show you the exact formula, the exact sequence, the exact recipe to have your alternative impairment rating upheld by the parties every single time, every single time. If you follow the formula, if you follow the recipe, your permanent impairment rating will be upheld by the parties. Why will your permanent impairment rating, your alternative permanent impairment rating be upheld by the parties? Because by following the procedure that has been established by case law, the purpose of the procedure is to provide an alternative impairment rating that's the correct rating, that's the accurate rating. And so by going through the proper sequence of steps, your alternative impairment rating falls through a series of filters. You might envision these in your mind as like funnels or sequential filters through which your opinion has to pass. And only a correct opinion, <laughs> only an accurate opinion, only a true opinion, only a substantial opinion falls out the bottom of the filters. An incorrect opinion, an opinion provided simply to provide a higher permanent impairment rating for the examinee, an opinion that simply attempts to manipulate the AMA guides will not successfully fall out the bottom of the filters. It'll get trapped in the filters. And the purpose of the filters and the purpose of the procedure is to allow, to allow only correct opinions to successfully fall through and out the bottom. And when your opinion successfully passes through the filters and falls out the bottom of the filters, it can be upheld by the parties as an accurate, true, and substantial opinion. So I wanna share with you uh, some insider secrets as to how to provide your alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman. So in order to illustrate the, the principles as to how to do that, we're gonna go through many, many case examples of uh, cases where qualified medical evaluators have provided for alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman. And I'm gonna share with you cases where the qualified medical evaluator's opinion has been upheld by the parties and has been upheld by the trier of fact because the qualified medical evaluator did the process correctly. And I'm gonna share with you many, many cases where unfortunately <laughs> the qualified medical evaluator uh, did not properly follow the steps in providing for an alternative impairment rating. And so the alternative impairment rating was exposed and was uh, exposed for what it really was, which is simply an attempt to manipulate the guides in order to provide for a higher permanent impairment rating for the examinee. See, an alternative impairment rating will not survive the filters unless it's true, <laughs> unless it's accurate, unless it actually fits the facts of the case 
And unless it actually qualifies as substantial medical evidence, it won't successfully pass through the filters. And I have many, many cases where, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, and we could speculate till the cows come home as to the reasons, but for whatever reason, the qualified medical evaluator mm, simply tried to provide for a higher permanent impairment rating for the examinee than the examinee truly deserved, truly deserved and truly qualified for. And as a result, the qualified medical evaluator could not strongly support the opinion for a higher permanent impairment rating. Or perhaps I should rephrase that and say the qualified medical evaluator poorly supported or could only weakly support the opinion for a higher impairment rating. And that higher impairment rating got stuck in the filters. We might think of these filters as truth filters such that only true, correct, and accurate opinions fall out through the bottom of the filters. And I have many cases on both sides of the coin that will illustrate these principles. So with no further ado, uh, let's get into today's discussion. And in today's discussion, we're gonna talk about the philosophy uh, of the Almarez and Guzman cases and how the Almarez and Guzman cases uh, apply to and interact with Labor Code 4660, which is the labor code that dictates how permanent disability ratings are established in the state of California. So let's begin uh, with a discussion now of Labor Code 4660. Okay, so let's talk about Labor Code 4660. Now, Labor Code 4660 was part of the Workers' Compensation Reform Package that was passed uh, with Senate Bill 899 in 2004, and then which became effective 1-1-2005. And it's Labor Code 4660 that ushered in the new era uh, and the new permanent disability rating schedule that incorporates the AMA guides that we are currently uh, using here in the state of California. So Labor Code 4660 is current law, and this is the law under which we are currently operating when it comes to uh, determining permanent disability ratings for examinees. So Section A of Labor Code 4660 tells us that in determining the percentages of permanent disability, account shall be taken of several things. Several things go into the final uh, permanent disability rating that is assigned to injured workers. So number one is the nature of the physical injury or disfigurement. And this is the realm of the qualified medical evaluator. It's the qualified medical evaluator that reports on the nature of the physical injury or disfigurement by providing a permanent impairment rating through the use of the AMA guides. So this, number one, this is the contribution of the qualified medical evaluator. The second thing that's uh, taken into consideration is the occupation of the injured employee. So that the same injury could result in a different impairment rating or a different permanent disability rating based on the occupation of the examinee. So for example, a vocal cord injury uh, signifies a much greater loss to an opera singer than it does to a jackhammer operator. So the occupation of the injury gets factored in to the final disability rating. The third thing uh, is the examinee's age at the time of the injury. So that younger younger employees, younger injured workers, are afforded higher permanent impairment ratings because they have longer and more working years ahead of them than do older or aged workers. And then finally, uh, there's a consideration being given to an employee's diminished future earning capacity. And this is uh, accomplished through the use of a diminished future earning capacity adjustment factor, which is a multiplication factor. So numbers two, three, and four 
the uh, diminished future adjustment, uh, diminished future earning capacity adjustment factor, those are all uh, taken care of down at the disability evaluation unit. So the dis disability evaluation unit relies upon the qualified medical evaluators permanent impairment rating in order to apply the occupation, in order to apply the age, and in order to apply the adjustment factor to the impairment rating to come up with a final disability rating. So let's talk about uh, how the nature of the physical injury or disfigurement is established through the use of the AMA guides. So Labor Code 4660B tells us that for purposes of this section, the nature of the physical injury or disfigurement shall incorporate, shall incorporate, and shall here is a key word that became an instrumental and pivotal word in the Almarez and Guzman uh, proceedings. So this law tells us that uh, we shall incorporate the descriptions and measurements of physical impairments and the corresponding percentages of impairment published in the AMA guides. So one of the key things that happened uh, in the Almarez and Guzman procedures, proceedings, is that qualified medical evaluators were attempting to go outside of the AMA guides in providing for alternative impairment ratings. And they did this in many different ways. And one of the primary ways that qualified medical evaluators went outside the guides is they went outside the guides by referring to uh, prior permanent disability rating schedules in describing the examinee's impairment and or disability. As I said, uh, Labor Code 4660 became uh, effective 1-1-2005. And so qualified medical evaluators were starting to refer to the permanent disability rating schedule in effect prior to 2005 in describing uh, the examinee's permanent disability. But that went, that was found to go contrary to law because Labor Code 4660 clearly established that the nature of the physical injury or disfigurement shall incorporate, shall incorporate, meaning must incorporate the descriptions found in the AMA guides. And therefore, this is what closed the door, closed the door on qualified medical evaluators' attempts to describe the examinee's impairment in this case by going outside uh, the confines of the AMA guides. And we'll see what the Almarez and Guzman cases had to say about the confines of the AMA guides. So Labor Code 4660C tells us that the schedule, the schedule, meaning the new permanent disability rating schedule that takes into consideration the nature of the injury and disfigurement, the occupation of the employee at the time of injury, the age of the employee at the time of injury, and the diminished future earning capacity adjustment factor, that's what's known as the schedule, the permanent disability rating schedule, shall be prima facie evidence of the percentage of permanent disability to be attributed to each injury covered by the schedule. So prima facie means based on first impression, or it's the accepted as correct until proven otherwise permanent disability percentage for each injury. So the schedule that we uh, uh, use, in other words, the permanent disability rating that spits out after the application of the schedule shall be the correct shall be accepted as the correct permanent disability rating until proven otherwise. So in order to prove that the schedule is not the correct permanent disability rating or that the schedule doesn't provide the correct permanent disability rating, the schedule has to be rebutted, has to be rebutted, has to be found as the incorrect, has to be found as an incorrect permanent disability rating. And that's the whole philosophy of alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman is to rebut the schedule and show that the scheduled rating, the scheduled rating 
is not correct. So in other words, in, in providing for alternative impairment ratings, the scheduled rating has to be rebutted. And in order to properly rebut the scheduled rating, your argument as the qualified medical evaluator has to be good and it has to be done properly. And that's the purpose of this program is to show you how to properly rebut the permanent disability rating that's provided for by the schedule. And then uh, the Almarez and Guzman proceedings uh, kind of put an exclamation point on their requirement that we stay within the four corners of the AMA guides by quoting and reiterating uh, Labor Code Section 4660D, which tells us that the schedule, the schedule, the schedule which relies on the measurements, charts, and tables of the AMA guides shall promote consistency, shall promote uniformity, and shall promote objectivity. And what the Almarez and Guzman proceedings exposed was that qualified medical evaluators attempts to, to describe the permanent disability rating by going outside the four corners of the AMA guides was compromising consistency, was compromising uniformity, was introducing inconsistency, and was in, introducing uh, non-uniformity in the permanent uh, disability ratings. So the law is clear that through use of the AMA guides and through use of the schedule in providing for permanent disability ratings uh, shall promote consistency and uniformity across uh, all evaluators, across all examinees, and across all specialties throughout the entire state of California. So let's summarize some of the key conclusions uh, that came out of uh, the en banc decisions of the Almarez and Guzman cases. And I've provided this entire document for you in your reading materials uh, as part of this program. And the main conclusion from the Almarez and Guzman decisions is that a permanent disability rating, which is established by use of the schedule, is rebuttable, is rebuttable it can be found to be an inaccurate or an incorrect rating. Well, the burden of rebutting a scheduled permanent disability rating rests with the party who's disputing the rating. Remember, uh, Labor Code 4660 tells us that the permanent disability rating that's established by the schedule is prima facie evidence of the correctness of the schedule. So the scheduled rating is presumed to be correct unless proven otherwise, and uh, the party that attempts to prove otherwise has the burden of proving it. So in some cases, uh, applicant, the applicant will uh, rebut a overly low permanent disability rating and attempt to uh, prove that a higher disability rating is more accurate. And in other cases, uh, the defense attorney uh, will attempt to prove that uh, an alternative impairment rating is too high and that the scheduled rating is the more accurate rating. So the burden of rebutting a scheduled rating rests with the party who's disputing it, who's disputing the rating. So one method of rebutting a scheduled permanent disability rating is to successfully challenge one of the component elements of that rating. And remember, there were four component elements of the rating, one of which is the whole person impairment rating under the AMA guides. So this seems to provide uh, the greatest source of opportunity for rebutting the uh, rating established by the schedule is to successfully challenge the whole person impairment under the AMA guides by showing that the whole person impairment rating under the AMA guides is incorrect or is not the most accurate, the most accurate description of the examinee's permanent impairment. And the Almarez and Guzman uh, conclusions were that physicians uh, can successfully challenge the standard ratings provided by the charts, tables, and chapters in the AMA guides by allowing the uh, qualified medical evaluator to utilize any chapter, any table, or any method 
in the AMA guides that most accurately reflects the injured employee's impairment. So now we're not pigeonholed. We're not limited. We're not uh, constrained to any particular table in the AMA guides. We're not constrained to any particular chapter, but we have the freedom to utilize the entirety of the AMA guides, the four corners of the AMA guides to come up with permanent impairment ratings that are the most accurate, most accurate description of the injured employee's impairment. And we're going to talk about how to most accurately describe uh, the impairment by talking about uh, several steps and procedures that your alternative opinion on the permanent impairment rating has to pass through in order to pop out the bottom of the truth filters and be an accurate description of the injured employee's impairment. You can't simply go on a fishing expedition throughout the AMA guides to come up with permanent impairment ratings that achieve a better or higher permanent impairment rating, but rather the alternative impairment rating using a different chapter, a different table, or a different method has to successfully qualify as substantial medical evidence to be considered to be the most accurate description of the injured employee's impairment. And we'll talk about that uh, as we progress through today's discussion. Now, in the beginning, when Almarez and Guzman uh, was first adopted in 2009, it seemed that providing for alternative impairment ratings was optional, that it was uh, not a requirement. But in uh, time since 2009, a consideration of alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman is now required in every single case. So a consideration of Almarez Guzman alternative impairment ratings is required in every single case that involves permanent impairment because this consideration of an alternative impairment rating contributes to what's referred to as a complete medical evaluation. So we're now required in every case to go through the AMA guides and to go through our mental Rolodex and think to ourselves, is it possible that there's another chart, another chapter, another table within the AMA guides that could possibly be a more accurate description of the examinee's impairment? Because our job is to, as qualified medical evaluators is to most accurately describe the examinee's permanent impairment rating so that that permanent impairment rating can be plugged in to the schedule down at the disability evaluation unit. An inaccurate permanent impairment rating is going to provide for a permanent disability uh, rating or disability permanent disability percentage that's inaccurate and does injustice or does not do justice to the injured worker. So in order to do justice and to do the proper thing for the examinee, it's critical that we accurately describe the permanent impairment in every single case. And that involves a consideration of alternative impairment ratings in addition to the impairment ratings that are provided under the strict application of the AMA guides. And this is uh, clearly described in the Guzman decision, which tells us to accommodate those complex or extraordinary cases. And in the Guzman decision, they referred to complex or extraordinary cases as those cases where the permanent impairment rating uh, is either not listed in the AMA guides or is not clearly described in the AMA guides. But this now applies to all cases. The AMA guides calls for the physician's exercise of clinical judgment to evaluate the impairment most accurately, most accurately, we're required to most accurately describe the impairment, even if that is possible, only by resorting to comparable conditions described in other charts, other chapters, and other tables of the AMA guides. So in every single case that involves a permanent impairment rating, you must, must, must provide an opinion as to whether a permanent impairment, whether an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman would be more accurate or whether 
an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman is not more accurate. So we're required to consider the entire range of permanent impairments that may apply to our examinee in every single case that involves permanent impairment. And a precedent has been set for qualified medical evaluators who do not provide a description of their consideration of alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman in those cases that involve uh, permanent impairment. So for example, in 2014, the qualified medical evaluator was replaced was replaced for refusing to consider an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman. And in his report, or I should say in his supplemental report, where one of the parties uh, asked him to consider if uh, an alternative impairment rating could possibly be a more accurate description of the examinee's impairment, the qualified medical evaluator wrote, he said, in regard to the question of Almarez and Guzman, I am of a mind with another doctor, another doctor who reported in the case, in that Almarez Guzman is basically a legalistic ploy that attempts to insinuate subjective complaints as a factor in impairment rating. Like Dr. Damore, I use the AMA guides and do not and never will use Almarez and Guzman. So apparently, uh, as uh, recently as 2014, this qualified medical evaluator considered that providing for alternative impairment ratings was optional, was not required, was elective. And uh, the judge in this case opined differently. And the judge in this case decided to replace the qualified medical evaluator and he, uh, and he supported his replacement of the qualified medical evaluator by citing uh, California Code of Regulation 31.5, which deals with QME replacement panel requests. CCR 31.5 tells us, uh, with regards to replacing a qualified medical evaluator, tells us a replacement QME to a panel or at the discretion of the medical director a replacement of an entire panel of QMEs shall be selected at random by the medical director and provided upon request whenever of the following occurs. And section 15 says the selected medical evaluator who otherwise appears to be qualified and competent to address all disputed medical issues refuses to provide when requested by a party or a medical director either a complete medical evaluation as provided in Labor Code sections 4062.3 and 4062.3K. So the provision of an alternative impairment rating is required in order for your evaluation to constitute a complete medical evaluation. In the absence uh, of an opinion for an alternative impairment rating or when refusing to provide an opinion on an alternative impairment rating, your uh, evaluation cannot constitute a complete medical evaluation because it does the examinee a disservice by refusing to consider if possibly another, another impairment rating within the four corners of the AMA guides could more accurately describe the examinee's permanent impairment. And that's fair, that's fair. We're required as qualified medical evaluators to do nothing more than to accurately describe the examinee's permanent impairment rating so that that permanent impairment rating can be plugged into the permanent disability rating schedule to adequately and properly compensate the injured worker for their losses. And that's the law and that's fair. So in your report, what if you, what if you think that uh, an alternative impairment rating for your examinee does not apply. How can you describe this in your report and show that you complied uh, with considering an alternative impairment rating in the case? So even if you do not uh, use an alternative impairment rating to describe the examinee's impairment, you still need to show the parties that you considered the range of impairments that could be applicable applicable to the examinee 
And here's how you can do that uh, in your report. You create a section in your report uh, with this heading, Alternative Impairment Rating under Almarez and Guzman. And this would go directly underneath uh, the Permanent Impairment heading in your report. So let me rephrase that. In your report, you have a topic heading entitled Permanent Impairment under which you would elaborate on all uh, the permanent impairments that relate to your examinee under the strict application of the AMA guides. And you would do a fabulous job in that section of your report. You would sum it up, total it up, and provide the parties with a final permanent impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides. Well then, under that section, also under the permanent impairment section of the report, this is a subheading under the permanent impairment major heading in your report, you provide this topic heading, alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman. You would simply say uh, something similar to the following. In my opinion, and within reasonable medical probability, the above permanent impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides is the most accurate description of Mrs. Smith's impairment. I do not find a need to consult with other charts, tables, or chapters within the AMA guides to more accurately describe the impairment. And this statement is satisfactory to demonstrate to the parties that you indeed considered other charts, other tables, other chapters, other methods within the AMA guides, and even though you did so, you believe that the permanent impairment rating provided for by the schedule under the strict application of the guides is the most accurate description of the impairment. Now, in the contrary, if you believe an alternative impairment rating applies to the examinee and you decide to provide for an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman, that opinion would also go under this same topic heading alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman, but your description of it would be greatly, greatly different, of course. And your description of the alternative impairment rating has to satisfy several important criteria in order for that alternative impairment rating to qualify as substantial medical evidence and in order for it to be upheld by the parties. So let's go into that discussion now as to how to provide for alternative impairment ratings that will be upheld by the parties and that do qualify as substantial medical evidence. So let's talk about substantial medical evidence. Now, every time you offer an opinion and conclusion within the body of your report, you need to make sure that every single one of those opinions and every single one of those conclusions qualify as substantial medical evidence. Now, all of us are familiar with opinions and all of us are familiar with conclusions and we all provide both of these uh, in our conversations and in our uh, QME reports. And substantial medical opinions are to be differentiated from conclusory opinions uh, in this context. Now, conclusory opinions, unlike substantial opinions, do not provide a reasoning or a basis for the opinion. So let me give you an example of a conclusory opinion uh, that you will see in qualified medical evaluators reports. A conclusory opinion on permanent impairment would be something similar to the following. In my opinion, uh, the DRE method is the more accurate description of Mrs. Smith's impairment versus the range of motion method, period. That's a conclusory opinion. Let me give you an example of another conclusory opinion regarding apportionment. In my opinion, 60% of the permanent impairment is due to the industrial injury, and 40% of the permanent impairment is due to other factors. Conclusory opinions provide only the conclusion a conclusory opinion that does not explain or provide the reasons why or the reasons behind the opinion 
are not substantial opinions. So substantial opinions take the conclusory opinion and explain them and support them and provide the how and why reasoning and gives point after point after point after point in support of the conclusory opinion. So substantial medical evidence as far as qualified medical evaluation reports was strongly uh, so substantiated with the Escobedo case, which told us in its major conclusion of the Escobedo case, told us that in order to constitute substantial medical evidence, a medical opinion must be, first of all, must be predicated on reasonable medical probability. So every time you offer an opinion or conclusion in your report, predicate it on reasonable medical probability. And you do that by using a phrase similar to the following. In my opinion, comma, within reasonable medical probability, comma, such and such and such and such and such and such, and provide the opinion. So you predicate it in advance on reasonable medical probability. And all you have to do is use that simple phrase. In my opinion, comma, within reasonable medical probability, comma, and then you provide the opinion or conclusion. Escobedo told us that a medical opinion is not substantial medical evidence if it's based on facts no longer germane, if it's based on, based on inadequate medical history or examinations, if it's based on incorrect legal theories, or if it's based on surmise, speculation, conjecture, or guess. Further, a medical report is not substantial evidence unless it sets forth the reasoning, the reasoning behind the physician's opinion, not merely his or her conclusions. Simply providing your conclusions is a conclusory opinion. A substantial opinion must set forth the reasoning behind your opinions, and the more reasons you have in support of your opinions, the more substantial your opinion will be. So every time you provide an opinion or conclusion in your report, you must support it with bullet point after bullet point after bullet point of reasons which support that opinion or conclusion. An opinion or conclusion that cannot be supported with multiple voluminous and compelling bullet pointed reasons is probably not an opinion that's true. It's probably not an opinion that's accurate. It's probably not an opinion that applies. Why doesn't it apply? Why isn't it accurate? Why isn't it truthful? Because it has no support. <laughs> it's not an opinion that can be strongly supported with multiple and compelling reasons. Further, one of the best ways that the parties can attack your opinions as not being substantial opinions is to show that your opinion is based on an inadequate examination. And I see qualified medical evaluators reports all the time that contain inadequate examinations, examinations that uh, do not use range of motion procedures described in the AMA guides, that do not use uh, range of motion normal findings uh, described in the AMA guides. And there's a hundred different examples of inadequate examinations. I, I was reviewing a qualified medical evaluator's report the other day and his neurologic examination for a spine injury uh, included only reflex testing, did not include sensory testing, did not include motor testing, did not include uh, nerve tension sign testing, and so it was certainly an inadequate examination. So in order for your opinions and conclusions to be substantial opinions and conclusions, they must be based on a fabulous examination because only a fabulous examination produces true and correct physical exam findings. Okay, another way to attack your opinion or conclusion as not a substantial opinion or conclusion is to show that you're guessing, that you're simply making stuff up. You're just speculating. You're just conjecturing. You're just surmising and basing your opinion on mm, 
stuff that has no basis it has no reasons and it has no support so substantial medical opinions are much different from conclusory opinions and I want you to go through your reports and identify those opinions that you're offering that attempt to be simply conclusory see gone are the days where doctors can simply pound their fist on the desk as if God has spoken and provide conclusory opinions without support those days are gone now our opinions and conclusions need to be supported they need to be based on voluminous and compelling reasons in order to qualify as substantial opinions and your permanent impairment ratings your opinion on permanent impairment ratings certainly have to be substantial in order to be upheld by the parties so that's the first step in providing alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman that will be upheld by the parties is that the permanent impairment rating first has to be a substantial uh, opinion okay now providing for alternative impairment ratings has some additional requirements as well which we'll go into uh, in just a couple minutes but let's find out a little bit more what case law has to tell us about substantial medical evidence okay so a couple of uh, important cases that describe uh, conclusions relating to substantial medical evidence the Granado case concluded that a mere legal conclusion in other words a conclusory opinion does not form a basis for a finding in other words a mere legal conclusion has no value has no utility in being able to resolve issues within the workers compensation system it does not even form the basis for a finding Zemke tells us that an opinion that does not disclose its underlying basis and gives a bare legal conclusion does not constitute substantial medical evidence let me give you an example let me give you an example imagine uh, at your home you had a roof inspector come out to inspect your roof uh, and for whatever reason you called a roofing expert out to your roof to check out your roof well after just a very few minutes the roofing inspector comes to you and he tells you you need a new roof it's going to be twenty thousand dollars in other words he provides for you a conclusory opinion that you need a new roof the bottom line the conclusion is you need a new roof a mere roofing inspection conclusion you need a new roof what is your natural reaction going to be and what is your next question going to be your next question is going to be what do you mean I need a new roof what what in the world what are you talking about what are you what do you base that on what what were your findings what are you telling me what what's up there what's going on and you're gonna want to know reasons 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 and you're gonna want to know the underlying basis underneath his conclusion that you need a new roof now imagine that the roofing inspector begins to give you reasons as to why you need a new roof and he gives you a reason such as uh, you have a dent in your gutter now are you going to be convinced that because you have a dent in your gutter you need a new twenty thousand dollar roof no you're not but if the roofing inspector gives you multiple bullet points of reasonings that are based on an adequate examination of the roof and are based on uh, significant facts regarding your roof then you're going to be more compelled to believe the conclusion of the roofing inspector so he comes to you and he says well you're missing shingles on the back right quadrant in the front there is uh, tears in the undersurface papering across the top across the eaves you have X finding and you uh, across the back you have Z finding and a B C D and he elaborates a list of findings what that shows you and clearly convinces you and he brings you pictures of what he found and he substantiates his conclusion 
through multiple facts, multiple reason, reasons, and a full examination of your roof, only then are you going to be compelled to accept the conclusion as an accurate conclusion that in fact you do need a new roof and it's going to cost you $20,000 to replace this roof. So in your personal life, you require that opinions and conclusions have some basis, have some reasoning, that they be substantial opinions. And in the work that we do, which is so important, it's the same. Now, the Bassett case told us that the chief value of an expert's testimony rests upon the material from which his or her opinion is fashioned, the material, the reasons, the references, the citations, the facts, the findings, the x-ray evidence, the physical exam findings, the historic facts, the material from which his or her opinion is fashioned, and the reasoning by which he progresses from the material to the conclusion. And it does not lie in the mere expression of the conclusion. You need a new roof. <laughs> Thus, the opinion of the expert is no better than the reasons upon which it is based. And you're familiar with this concept in your personal life. And it's now being applied to our medical legal evaluations in that each opinion and conclusion that you offer within the body of your report has to be supported by voluminous and compelling reasons. The more voluminous and the more compelling are the reasons, the more substantial is the opinion. So let's talk about how to apply substantial medical evidence to your alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman. So in order to do that, a little bit of supporting philosophy came out of the Guzman three decision, which told us that the decision does not allow, does not allow a physician to conduct a fishing expedition through the guides simply to achieve a desired result. The physician's opinion must constitute substantial evidence of whole person impairment and therefore it must set forth the facts and the reasoning that justify it. Now, you have to realize that providing for alternative impairment ratings many times has the effect of doubling, tripling, quadrupling, heptupling, non-tupling, in other words, nine times, ten times the permanent impairment rating. And so uh, we're not allowed to use alternative impairment ratings simply to achieve a higher permanent impairment rating for the examinee. Alternatively, the opinion must set forth the facts and the reasoning that justify it. And if you're going to double or triple an examinee's permanent impairment rating, in order for the parties to accept that rating and compensate the examinee in accordance with that rating, it better be supported by facts and it better be supported by voluminous and compelling reasons otherwise the parties will simply reject it as an opinion that's not substantial so the guzman decision goes on and tells us that simply presenting a view contrary to an established rating in the guides would not be sufficient to rebut the permanent disability rating schedule rating which remember the permanent disability rating schedule rating is prima facie evidence of the accuracy of the rating. So simply providing a view contrary to the prima facie rating is insufficient. An impairment rating that is inadequately supported by evidence and reasoning and certainly or unquestionably a rebuttal position arrived at by hunting through the guides for a more favorable or higher rating will certainly result in an opinion that the workers compensation judge will necessarily reject as insufficient evidence and I'm going to share with you case after case after case where the qualified medical evaluator either inadequately or poorly or weakly supported the higher or more for favorable rating and the rating uh, was rejected by the workers compensation judge and also I'm going to share with you many many cases 
where the qualified medical evaluator was able to support with good evidence and with good reasoning why a higher permanent impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman was more accurate and the higher impairment rating uh, was upheld, was uh, accepted as substantial medical evidence and was upheld uh, by the workers' compensation judge. So let's talk about the exact sequence and the exact formula that your report must comply with in order to constitute substantial medical evidence under Almarez and Guzman. Well, in order to constitute substantial medical evidence under Almarez and Guzman, the most important thing is that you be able to explain to the parties why, 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 number one, why, number one, uh, the impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides is not accurate and why an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman is more accurate. So the key question that has to be answered in order for your opinion to qualify as substantial medical evidence is why. And this was established in the Martinez versus the city of Bakersfield case, which concluded that in order to support a case for rebuttal, in other words, in order to rebut the schedule, the scheduled rating, under the AMA guides, the physician must be permitted to explain why a departure from the impairment percentage is necessary and how he or she arrived at a different rating. Without a complete presentation of the supporting evidence on which the physician has based his or her clinical judgment, the trier of fact may not be able to determine whether a party has successfully rebutted the scheduled rating or instead has manipulated the guides to achieve a more favorable impairment assessment. So as qualified medical evaluators, we need to quicken our thinking into the realm of how and why, how and why, why we uh, depart from the AMA guides and why we employ an alternative impairment rating and how we arrive at the alternative impairment rating. Now I'm going to give you the exact formula as to how uh, to explain to the parties why you departed from the strict application of the guides and how you arrived at your alternative impairment rating. But before I do that, remember, it's important to remember that under Almarez and Guzman, many times the Almarez Guzman alternative impairment ratings allow for doubling tripling, quadrupling, etc., the permanent impairment rating that's found under the schedule, under the strict application of the AMA guides. So this is going to catch the party's attention when you attempt to double, triple, and quadruple the costs associated with compensating the examinee uh, in the form of a permanent disability award. So it has to be done just right. It has to provide for an accurate permanent impairment rating of the examinee, otherwise it will be promptly rejected by the parties as simply uh, your attempt to manipulate the guides in order to obtain a more favorable result. So therefore the use of an alternative impairment rating has to follow some exacting rules which I'm going to give you now. So here's the magic formula. This was described in the Kramer versus County of Sonoma case. In order to properly rate using Almarez and Guzman, the doctor is expected to do some certain things, and I'll explain those to you in just a second. So I want you to imagine your report. In the permanent impairment section of your report, under the heading permanent impairment, you're going to go ahead and you're going to go ahead and provide the permanent impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides. And you're going to go through your normal methodology as to how the AMA guides would rate a certain condition in the chapter associated with that condition using the charts and tables that describe impairments associated with that condition. So you're going to go through your entire formulation of providing a strict rating per the AMA guides. And that 
is step number one. Then underneath that whole discussion, you're going to create a new sub subheading. And this is under the main topic heading of permanent impairment. So the subheading is alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman. And in this section, this subsection under the permanent impairment section of your report, you're going to, number one, you're going to reiterate your strict rating that you came up with in the preceding section of your report. So you might simply say something similar to the following. In my opinion, Mrs. Smith's impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides is 16% whole person impairment, period. See discussion above. And you refer the reader of your report to the section above where you, wherein you went through the entire formulation as to how you arrove at the permanent impairment rating of 16% whole person. Then in a new paragraph, you're going to go through step number two in the procedure to properly rate using Almarez and Guzman. Step number two is you're going to explain to the parties why the strict rating does not accurately reflect the applicant's disability. Now, your reasoning why the strict rating is not accurate had better be good. It had better be good. It has to be good. It has to be good reasons. You need to have multiple voluminous and compelling reasons as to why the strict rating is not accurate. Now, more important than voluminous reasons are compelling reasons. I suggest that your reasons be voluminous and compelling. Now, this is where the litmus, litmus truth test comes into play. This is where your opinion starts passing through those filters that I was talking about earlier uh, in the discussion. If you're not able to come up with voluminous and compelling reasons as to why the strict rating is not accurate, then guess what? The strict rating is accurate. If you don't have reasons as to why it's not accurate, then by default, by prima facie evidence according to the law, then the strict rating is the most accurate. So your reasons here have to be good. Has to be good. You have to be able to convince yourself. When you review this section in your report, you have to be able to convince yourself that the reasons that you provided are good, that they're compelling, that they're convincing. Now, these reasons are not simply statement restatements of facts. You have to explain why these facts contribute to a rating that's not accurate, and it has to be good. Once you're done with that, then you go through step three in the procedure for properly rating under Almarez and Guzman, and that is to now provide the parties with an alternative rating within the four corners of the AMA guides. So herein is where you have the opportunity to go ahead and provide the rating that you feel is a more accurate rating, whether that be a rating in a different chapter, whether it be uh, simply a rating within the same chapter but using a different method, whether it be uh, a rating method that uh, applies a set of different rules that are typically associated with a chart or a table in the AMA guides, whatever your alternative methodology is, this is where you have an opportunity to provide it to the parties. And then finally, in a separate paragraph, so these are all in separate paragraphs, in a final paragraph, you have to explain why, explain to the parties why that alternative uh, impairment rating most accurately reflects the applicant's level of disability most accurate. In other words, why is it more accurate than the impairment rating that's provided for under the strict application of the AMA guides? And here you must have voluminous and compelling reasons and they better be good.
they better be good. You yourself have to convince yourself that these reasons are good first. If you yourself are unconvinced, guess what the parties will be? Do you think the parties will be convinced that they should adopt your doubling, your tripling, your quadrupling, your more favorable result, your more desirable alternative impairment rating? Do you think the parties are going to accept it and adopt it with its doubling, tripling, and quadrupling of costs if the reasons behind it are not good? They have to be good. You have to be convinced yourself first before you can attempt to convince the parties. Now, if you're not able to provide multiple and compelling reasons as to why the alternative impairment rating is more accurate, then guess what? It's not more accurate. <laughs> Unless it can be supported by compelling reasons, then the strict application rating by default is the more accurate rating. So don't provide an alternative impairment rating unless you have reasons, reasons, reasons in support of the rating. Uh, an alternative impairment rating without compelling and, and voluminous reasons is simply a conclusory opinion that does not qualify as a substantial opinion and it will properly be rejected by the parties. So imagine this. Let's go back to your report now. Let's take a look at your report. In your report, this section would be formatted somewhat as follows. So this is under a separate subheading in your report entitled Alternative Impairment Rating under Almarez and Guzman. Step number one. In my opinion, the above permanent impairment rating, uh, no, I'm sorry. In my opinion, Mrs. Smith qualifies for 16% whole person impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides, period. See discussion above. There's step one. New paragraph. In my opinion, the above impairment rating of 16% whole person impairment is not the most accurate reflection of Mrs. Smith's true impairment, period. Reasons for this conclusion include colon, new line, bullet point, reason number one, and explain the reason why it's not accurate. Reason number two, explain why it's not accurate. Reason number three, explain why, and the more reasons and the more compelling are your reasons, the better. Step number three, in my opinion, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith's impairment rating is most accurately described as such and such, such and such, and you go here into the chart, table, table, or chapter of the AMA guides that more accurately describes the impairment rating and give the final percentage of the rating. Finally, step number four, in my opinion, the above alternative impairment rating of, let's say, 30% whole person impairment is the most accurate description of Mrs. Smith's impairment, period. Reasons for this conclusion include colon, new line, new line, reason number one, and explain why the alternative impairment rating is most accurate. Reason number two, explain why it's most accurate. Reason number three, explain why. And the more reasons, the more voluminous reasons, and the more compelling are the reasons, the more accurate and the more truthful and the more appropriate is the alternative impairment rating compared to the strict rating uh, under the scheduled rating of the AMA guides. So doctors, can you see how this four-step procedure that we use to qualify the opinion as substantial medical evidence, can you see how this serves as a series of truth filters? If your opinion, if your opinion as to why the strict rating is not accurate, if your opinion is not true, it'll get clogged right here because it's not supported by reasons, reasons, reasons. If you are able to support the opinion with reasons, 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 then the opinion passes through the filter. Then, if your 
not able to provide an alternative impairment rating that's supported by multiple and voluminous reasons, the opinion gets stuck right here. It doesn't pass through the filter as to why, as to why, as to why, the why filter. It gets stuck in the why that alternative rating most accurately reflects applicant's level of disability filter. Only an opinion that's supported by multiple voluminous and compelling reasons can pass through the filter to drop out the bottom as an opinion that qualifies as a substantial opinion, which is an opinion that can be used by the parties. So you need to go through this procedure with every single case and decide for yourself if you're going to provide an alternative impairment rating based upon whether or not the opinion successfully passes through uh, the truth filters. And the litmus test as to the substantial substantiability of the opinion is the voluminous and compelling reasons. They have to be compelling reasons. So doctors, I hope this helps you. Remember that providing for alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman has the effect of potentially doubling, tripling, quadrupling, and more your permanent impairment rating that's provided for under the strict application of the AMA guides. And I have many, many cases I want to share with you where uh, the qualified medical evaluator employed an alternative impairment rating and it, it did. It quadrupled it heptupled, it non-nuppled nine and ten times the scheduled rating. So the use of alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman is high stakes. It's a high stakes game. And the reason it's high stakes is number one, because of the monetary uh, impact and the monetary consequence of an alternative impairment rating. And then number two is because in employing an alternative impairment rating, you're attempting to rebut the law. You're attempting to rebut Labor Code 4660. You're attempting to rebut the accuracy of the scheduled rating in the AMA guides. You're, you're effectively attempting to rebut the Bible, which is the AMA guides. What you're simply saying by employing an alternative impairment rating is that, hey, the AMA guides are not correct or not accurate on this issue. And in my opinion, an alternative impairment rating is more correct. So be prepared for your alternative impairment rating to draw great scrutiny from the parties for both of those two reasons. Number one, because of the financial impact, and number two, because you're going up against uh, established authority in the AMA guides and established authority in Labor Code 4660. So this is high stakes game. Don't simply uh, throw out alternative impairment ratings because you think you're trying to provide a more favorable outcome for one or more of the parties or because you're trying to be cool or just trying to be creative and alternative. No, only provide for alternative impairment ratings when your alternative impairment rating opinion can successfully pass through the filters. So if you have in mind an alternative impairment rating that you think is more accurate for your examinee, go ahead and run it through this exercise of running it through the filters of explaining why the impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides is not accurate. And if you're able to come up with multiple voluminous and compelling reasons, it's possible that that is true, that the strict application of the AMA guides is not accurate. Then run it through the exercise of providing for an alternative impairment rating somewhere extracted from the four corners of the AMA guides and then come up with multiple and compelling reasons as to why this alternative impairment rating is more accurate or is the most accurate description of the impairment. And if your opinion can successfully complete this exercise, can successfully pass through the truth filters then you've got a winner. You've got a winner. You've got an opinion that can double the permanent impairment rating, can triple, can quadruple the permanent impairment rating and will be upheld by the parties because it's true. <laughs> it's only true when it qualifies as substantial medical evidence and it's only true when it can successfully pass through 
the filters. That's the purpose of this procedure. That's why it was established. It was established to eliminate opinions that are clearly simply conclusory opinions uh, only that are provided only to try and provide a more favorable outcome, which is a higher uh, impairment rating for one or more of the parties. So this procedure has been established in case law to allow us to run our opinions through filters. And those opinions that survive the filters will be upheld by the parties because they're able to be supported with how and why reasoning, because they're based on an adequate examination. They're based on correct legal theories. They're not based on surmise, speculation, conjecture, or guess. They will be upheld by the parties because they're actually true. <laughs> what a concept. So if you have an opinion or conclusion that's not true, an alternative impairment rating that's not true, that you're just making up, you're going to look bad because it will become obvious to everyone that you're simply trying to achieve a better result. <clears throat> so employ this four-step formula with every alternative impairment rating that you come up with and those opinions that survive the four-step formula are representative of winning opinions and those opinions that cannot survive uh, you can promptly discard and go ahead and stick with the strict application of the AMA guides in this particular case. And maybe an alternative impairment rating will apply uh, to another case in the future. So doctors, I hope this helps you. In our next session, we're gonna go over several cases where qualified medical evaluators have successfully used this four-step procedure to hit home run, home run permanent impairment ratings that do double, triple, quadruple the impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides. And these qualified medical evaluators were only able to do it because they followed the four-step formula. So I look forward to being with you on our very next session. And for now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter wishing you the best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.